Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Pleasure singing and worshiping with you this morning, and how even if we look at the middle, how God brings families together to make a difference. <laughs> For those that are uh, watching online, got a husband and wife sitting, one with a bear jersey and one with a Packers jersey, and there's a big game this afternoon, so I just. It's a small thing, but it's a fun thing. Uh, well, um, I'm excited to speak today. Not that I'm not always excited to speak, but um, I am excited today. Um, I think I had an interesting revelation this week, or just reminder about headlights that I've kind of been, boy, oncoming headlights these days, they just seem brighter than usual. And, I did a little research and more and more vehicles have these new LED headlights which are brighter, a wider light, and it improves illumination, which is a good thing. Um, when you're the benefactor, when the lights are going in the direction that you intend to go, but when you're oncoming going in the opposite direction of the lights, it can be a problem. Does anyone ever, you know, kind of have to shield their eyes? Yeah. Okay, so it's, you know, it's the, it's the direction thing, when, they're, when the lights are shining, but when they're coming at you. And, you know, we tend to evaluate things from our perspective exclusively, you know, so I think of them as an annoyance, you know, frequently. But, you know, they're both an annoyance and a blessing. And the whole thing is direction. And I got to be thinking about a parallel or a potential parallel. You can either throw it out or, or think of it as positive. That... You know, Jesus, when he came into the world, he said, I'm the light of the world. And the one who believes and follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And, and I can remember some years ago reading that for the first time, and that was a very appealing idea of Jesus being the light of the world and being able to guide and lead us forward, and very appealing. But then I thought about the whole headlight thing, and, you know, there are times where I'm sinking with Jesus, and he and I are going in the same direction. But there are times where, from the scriptures and through other means, where I see that Jesus is actually has some ideas that, that I don't naturally sync with. And, and when in a way, I'm going the opposite direction. And so I really like it a lot when Jesus' light is going my direction. It's kind of like, yeah, okay, good, I like that. But when Jesus' light is oncoming and telling me your direction might be a little off, Steve... Uh, then I tend to, to get annoyed. And, um, and it's interesting because, um, you know, I'm a pastor. That's really not a big deal. But I struggle with sin. And I struggle with not aligning always consistently with Jesus and needing to have my thinking reshaped or some of my habits or practices reshaped. And so... I've just been challenged to when I encounter headlights down the road that, you know, are annoying to me, that I ought to think about, hey, you know, it's, I shouldn't expect Jesus to come along always to my point of view, but perhaps I'm the one that needs a direction change now and then. I ought to be open to that. And, um, you know, like you, perhaps, um, you know, I can struggle with rationalizing my lack of love. For other people and my lack of grace in certain situations. I can minimize or trivialize the impact of selfish words that I may speak or selfish actions that motivating them. And oftentimes when that light, when that light of Jesus kind of reveals those kind of things to me, just like when I'm driving, I, I tend to want to obscure it with my hand or with my visor. And you know, we can, I can obscure Jesus' light that's a little different than my natural way of thinking, you know, by, you know, saying it's not relevant, trivializing it in some way. It's, it's not pertinent to my situation. But you know, the good thing, I mean, that's, that's not good. But I think we've all been there at different times and in different ways. The fortunate thing is that this Jesus, who is the light of the world, he is both revealer and does reveal our faults and our inconsistencies and our failure. He, do, he does reveal it. 
but he's also, he's revealer and healer. And that's a good thing. And he reveals the things that are afflicting me inside and that are working their way out into my life. And again, he can heal that. And he does this because he's both the selfless sufferer when he went to the cross for our sins, and he's also the generous victor who rose from the grave and conquered sin and death, not just for himself, but for every human person and shares it generously. He's a compassionate forgiver, and he's an indwelling empowerer above and beyond our sin. So this gives hope. And is, it's connected to our story today. You know, God is all about seeing us as we are, loving us as we are, but wanting to help us get better and live better. And that requires sometimes shining his light that can be uncomfortable. But the scriptures talk about how God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. The scriptures talk about if we confess our sins, not sweep them under the carpet, not deny that they exist, not trivialize or try and compare them to someone else that we feel is somehow worse than us. But if we confess our sins, it says that God in Christ Jesus is faithful and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And so, again... When the bright light of God and Christ is a little uncomfortable at times, it's actually a good thing. God trying to help us experience him more fully. And we're going to see that um, as we get into Joseph. So how about I pray and we get into this continuing story of God's hand in Joseph's life, which helps us see God's hand and overall purposes in our life. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the pleasure of singing about you this morning. Thank you for the pleasure of singing to you. Um, it is a wonderful thing, the way the mixture of melodies and rhythms and lyrics can come together in such a way that just lifts our spirits, aligns our hearts and minds with you in fresh ways, and gives you pleasure as we sing and open ourselves to you that way. So Lord, we thank you for all the different contributors and how you brought it all together this morning and how you do that on our Sunday mornings as we gather. Lord, we ask that you would um, pour out your grace on us and your Holy Spirit in a special and unique way. Lord, thank you that you know us better than we know ourselves, and you know what's around the corner for us and what's in the past. And Lord, as the forward-thinking God that you are, and you're always moving forward, it's not that you forget or don't know about the past, you do, but you are not stuck in the past, and you do not want us to be stuck there either. So, Lord, would you prepare? Would you heal? Would you speak to us where and how we need to be spoken to? Thank you that you are loving and kind and also very purposeful, leading us forward or wanting to lead us forward into a good future that blesses us and blesses others and accomplishes your purposes in the world. So, Lord, speak now through your living and active scriptures. Thank you that they've stood the test of times for generations and millennia. And they have the power to lift us and elevate us and move us forward by your grace. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right. Today is about moving beyond the shadows of the past. And again, just a quick reminder about where we are with Joseph is that, you know, we started in Genesis 37, which begins the life of Joseph, and it talks about him having a dream. A couple of dreams, in fact, but it's really part of a broader context because in Genesis chapter 12, all the way up to 37, the bigger context is, is God touching the life of a man named Abraham and his wife Sarah and saying, making an outlandish promise to Abraham and to Sarah, your descendants will be as numerous as the stars in the sky 
and you will all people will be blessed through your descendants, which is startling because Abraham and Sarah had been married for quite some time and had been trying for quite some time unsuccessfully to have children of their own and they could not have children of their own. So when this God comes to them and says, your descendants are going to be as numerous as the stars of the sky, it's an outlandish and a ridiculous sounding promise. Yet says Abraham believed. And God credited that to him as righteousness. And so the going forward, this is all about how God is going to accomplish this promise for his larger purposes. He's not just interested in Abraham. Remember, your descendants, Abraham and Sarah, will bless all the peoples of the earth. That's what God's thinking. All the peoples of the earth primarily, and Abraham and Sarah and those that will follow are part of that. See, God has bigger, larger, greater purposes. As much as God cares about the specifics of my life and the specifics of your life and your life and everyone's life, God has a whole bigger thing that he's thinking about. And that can be unnerving to us because we would rather that God focused exclusively on us and only us. You know, we would never say that. But at times, we kind of act that way, that God's only zeroed in on me. But God has a much bigger thing going on and wants to draw us into that. And so Abraham and Sarah, and then they had Isaac. And then as we go through Genesis 12 and toward 37, it's about Abraham and Sarah. It's about Isaac and his family. And Jacob is one of the sons of Isaac. And Jacob is the father of Joseph. So that's kind of how we got to 37. And again, bigger purposes that God is trying to accomplish in the world that we need to be mindful of in this history, but also in our own lives as well. God's never just zeroed in exclusively on you. Because it's never just about me. It's never just about you. And that's actually a good thing. So again, Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers, his older brothers, and older brothers are supposed to look out for the youngers. But Joseph was sold into slavery by his older brothers, who then lied to their father when they came back and made it seem like he was killed by a wild animal. Continuing, as a slave in Egypt, Joseph was falsely accused, jailed, and then forgotten in prison. But the scriptures describe how the Lord was with Joseph in all these difficult and painful circumstances. And he helped him thrive and bless others in the difficult circumstances that he was in. More specifically, later on, the Lord gave Joseph insight into Pharaoh's dreams in order to prepare Egypt, the nation of Egypt, for the coming famine. A famine of seven years, which is a staggeringly long famine. And then last week, we were reminded that the Lord helped Joseph lead Egypt into feeding its own people, saving the resources from an abundant seven years in order so that when the seven years of famine came, they would be covered. And so that was all Joseph being led by God getting the attention of Pharaoh. He led Egypt to feed its own people and not starve and suffer, and to feed other nations. And that's where we left off last week. And so now we get even a bigger picture of, you know, God's not just concerned about Joseph. God's not just concerned about Egypt. God has something bigger going on, which we see as we begin reading Genesis 41, verse 57, and move into chapter 42. Follow along with me. It's on the, the screen behind me. Starting in verse 57 of chapter 41 and just moving right into 42. And all the world, all the world came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph. Remember, Pharaoh put Joseph in charge of pretty much everything and of this massive civic undertaking in order to bring in seven years of abundance and take 20% and store it away for when it was needed. And so all the world came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph because Pharaoh put him in charge. There was no one who had more power in Egypt than Joseph except Pharaoh himself. When Jacob heard, again, Joseph's father, who doesn't know that Joseph is alive, hasn't seen Joseph for over 13 years. When Jacob heard 
the grain was available in Egypt, he said to his sons, why do you just keep looking at each other? Can you hear his tone of voice? You know, I'm getting old. You're my sons. You're in charge of the family well-being. There's a famine going on. We're running short of supplies. And you can hear the tone in his voice. Why do you just keep looking at each other? Do something. I've heard that there's grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy enough grain to keep us alive. Otherwise, we'll die. What Jacob didn't know was perhaps they had heard that there was food in Egypt as well. But as soon as they heard the word Egypt, ah, ah, it's the third rail, don't touch Egypt, don't touch Egypt. We sold our brother into slavery 13 years ago and he went down to Egypt. We don't know if he's alive or dead. We're not having anything to do with Egypt. But that's all private. That's all internal. And Jacob's like, why are you just doing nothing? Just looking at each other. Go down to Egypt. Everyone knows there's grain in Egypt. Get going. Well, we know why they don't want to go down to Egypt. Or they're uninterested in any discussion because it's a very painful, you know, they've swept this thing that they did to Joseph under the carpet for 13 years. Maybe they forgot about it. Or there were little reminders here and there. But when Egypt is seen as the source of hope, no, 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 Egypt isn't the source of hope. We don't want to go there. But at their father's admonition, they go down and they buy enough grain to be kept alive. He says, otherwise we'll die. So the ten, Joseph's ten older brothers went down to Egypt to buy grain. But Jacob wouldn't let Joseph's younger brother, remember there's twelve brothers, Joseph and Benjamin are from the same mother. Again, there's, there's, there's other women that have children in the family. Their mother died when Benjamin was born. So there's a special bond between Benjamin and Joseph. There's also a special bond with their father Jacob because the mother that died was actually the first woman that he really loved. The others really not so much, but had plenty of children with them. So, he sent Joseph to go check on his brothers 13 years ago when they were herding sheep in a remote region, and Joseph never came back. He said, I'm not letting Jacob, I'm sorry, letting Benjamin go with you. I'm afraid something will happen to him just like Joseph. So, there's these old wounds from 13 years ago that are getting scratched, like a scab that's opening up again. I won't let him go with you, for I fear that some harm may come to him. Continuing on in verse 6. Now Joseph was governor of the land. He was governor of Egypt. We've kind of looked at that before. He was the one who sold grain to all its people. So when Joseph's brothers arrived down to Egypt, and the journey might have taken a month, maybe less. When they arrived down in Egypt... They bowed down to the leader of Egypt. They were told, this is the one who's in charge of the grain distribution. They came and saw, okay, here he is. And remember, we had saw when Pharaoh put Joseph in charge, he was given fantastic linen robes and a signet ring. It was all dressed up and to demonstrate that he had all the authority of Egypt. So it's not surprising when they come into Joseph's presence, their brother, 13 years have passed, and he's all dressed up like an Egyptian. They have no reason so they don't recognize him at all, but he recognizes them. Verse 7, as soon as Joseph saw his brothers, ten of them all together, he recognized them, but pretended not to, and spoke harshly to them. Where do you come from? He asked. And they explained, we're from the land of Canaan, we've come down for food. He said, you're spies. So he's putting them... On the defensive, he's putting them under pressure. Maybe this was, you know, again, he's caught off guard here. He sees them, but, you know, this is kind of, all of a sudden, this terribly painful incident from 13 years ago where his brother sold him into slavery is brought front and center to him unexpectedly in front of him in his new position. 
It was an uncomfortable situation for him, and then he decided he made it uncomfortable for them as well. Where do you come from? Your spies, in verse 10. No, 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 my Lord. Again, they're recognizing his authority and his standing. No, 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 my Lord. They answered, your servants have come to buy food. We're not here to spy. You don't have to worry about us. We're all sons. We're all the sons of one man. Your servant are honest men, not spies. No, he said. See, look what they said in verse 11. We are all the sons of one man. That's not true. There are ten of the twelve. They're not all the sons of one man. Your servants are honest men, not spies. Okay, you just lied to me, and now you say you're honest men. Hmm. No, he said. In his assertion, no, and, and again asserting that they're spies, they continue. They get a little more truthful now. Well, verse 13, your servants were twelve brothers, the sons of one man who lives in Canaan. The youngest is now with our father. One is no more. Okay, so a little more specifics, a little more, but there's a, there's a little fact that's been avoided here, right? The one who is no more, they don't know it's Joseph, but their hand in him being no more is completely continuing to be swept under the carpet. Joseph said to them again in verse 14, Your spies, this is how you will be tested to know if what you're saying is true. You will not leave this place unless your younger brother comes here. Send one of you to get your brother. The rest of you will be kept in prison so your words may be tested. And he put them all in custody for three days. Whoa. That's a little harsh. Well, maybe, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Again, this is a very uncomfortable situation, clearly. And he knows what they did to him out of jealousy for his special relationship with their father. He's concerned about the well-being of his younger brother. He's not had any connection with them for 13 years. For all he knows, they did away with him, Benjamin, as well. So he says, I need proof. I need proof that, you know, without revealing his identity, I need proof that Benjamin is okay, without using Benjamin's name, the youngest. So he says, you know what? You're not leaving this place until the youngest comes here in front of me, and that will prove that you're telling me the truth, and you're not just lying to me. So one of you, pick one to go back home and bring him back, and the rest of you are going to stay in prison, and while we think about this, all of you are going to be in prison for three days, in custody. That's what it says in 17. And he put them all in custody for three days. We see a change. After the three days in custody, there's a change. You can see a change in Joseph. Look in verse 18. On the third day, Joseph said to them, Do this and you will live, for I fear God. There's a mention of, I fear God here. Do this and you will live, and I will fear God. Oh, though we all stay in custody and we send one? No, he's changed. If you are honest men, let one of you stay here in prison. And the rest of you go and take grain back for your starving households. But you must bring your youngest brother to me, so your words may be verified and you may not die. And then this they began to do. This is a really interesting thing that's going on here. Again, a fractured relationship. They don't know who they're dealing with. His initial response to them is quite harsh. You're all going to be in prison. I'm actually going to put you all in prison for three days just so you can get the feel of it. And then only one of you is going to go. All of you are going to be in custody. But then after three days, there's a change. 
And he says, you know, I fear God. So it sounds like he's been in consultation with God during these three days, and he softened his stance. Also, you could potentially see connections to, this, to the idea of the, the future Messiah of three days in jail, one makes the payment for all, and the others are set free. So it changes. And he says, leave one. The rest of you go. Sounds like a better deal. Sounds like better for them. He's also, take grain back to your families, your starving households. Just bring the younger brother back, and that will set the one free. But notice, he doesn't just say that will set the one who remains free. Several times he says, or you, twice he says, or you will die. In verse 20, but you must bring your youngest brother to me so your words may be verified and you may not die. In verse 19, if you're honest men, let one of you stay here in prison while the rest of you go back and take grain to your starving households before he said, listen to me or you will die. He's talking about a bigger, he doesn't realize, but he's talking about a bigger picture. God's bigger, you know, God is committed to bigger purposes of creating a nation, a people set apart for him, honoring his promise to Abraham of the family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What's the takeaway for us before we get into too many details? God's purposes often involve relational reconciliation. God's greater purpose. You know, again, this isn't just about strife within a family. This is about what God is doing on a national and ultimately global scale. And part of that is bringing some form of conflict resolution and reconciliation to this fractured household. It's not... You know, remember how much Jacob suffered? Remember when he was finally elevated and made in charge of Egypt and, and Pharaoh gave him a wife and it says that the wife had children and he named the children after, you know, after his suffering. Saying that God has seen my suffering and now I'm twice blessed. His children, Manasseh and I forget the other name. But... Again, not just about Joseph and his circumstances, but the bigger picture of things. And God's bigger purposes often involve relational reconciliation and, reconciliation and conflict resolution on a personal level. Because again, these are the agents that are bringing God's purposes. And so it's incumbent upon us to look up upon and pay close attention to the relationships in our lives, in our working situations, in our family situations, in our friends. And if there's conflict, that if there's wrong that's been done, you need to make it right. You need to make amends. You need to, you know, there needs to be forgiveness. And that's ultimately what's going to happen here in a couple of chapters. You know, Joseph had no desire, remember? God made me forget my connections with my family and all I suffered in my household. That was one of his children's name. And the other was, I'm now twice fruitful in the land of my suffering. Joseph didn't go looking for his brothers. God brought them together because he wants to bring about reconciliation. And his overall purpose is often involved conflict resolution, and relational reconciliation. We have to take those things seriously in our own lives. Continuing on in verse 21. So, they've agreed to this. In verse 21, they said to one another, Surely we are being punished. Now remember, Joseph is representing Egypt. He's communicating in the Egyptian language, and the scriptures are going to show us he's speaking to them through an interpreter. They're speaking Hebrew. So they said to one another in Hebrew, believing that they were talking privately, because, well, these Egyptians, they don't know our language, we can talk privately. They said to one another, surely we're being punished because of our brother. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded for him. This is a memory from 13 years ago. 
Guys, remember when he was in that cistern pleading for his life and when we put him in the hands of those traitors that were going to and he pleaded, don't send me away, don't send me, he's the youngest. They're remembering his pleas, his cries, the horror on his face, the trauma of being sold by his older brothers. And they're remembering it. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded for us for his life. But we wouldn't listen. That's why this distress has come on us. And Reuben replied, Reuben was the oldest, and being the oldest, he would be the one who would ultimately be watching out for the welfare of the youngers. Reuben replied, didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy? But you wouldn't listen. Now me must, must give an accounting for his blood. They have presumed that Joseph is dead. 23, they did not realize that Joseph could understand them since he was using an interpreter. And so Joseph as a third party, and they don't know, he's, he's witnessing all this turmoil within his brothers whom he hasn't seen, in this remorse, in this regret. And, you know, when they say, remember how he pleaded and the anguish, I'm sure that brought back powerful memories for Joseph as well. And so the scripture says that in 24, he turned away from them. He just, he just, it was too much. He turned away from them and began to weep. He left, you know, he went out of the room. Didn't want them to see him like that. He turned away, but he was deeply moved, remembering that trauma, 13, and then seeing his brothers hash over it in his presence, and them suffering now. He turned away from them and began to weep, but then came back and spoke to them again. And he had Simeon taken from them and bound before their eyes. So remember he had said, one must stay in prison. Here's what I offer. One stays in prison, the rest go back. Didn't give them a chance to say, okay, we're going to put so-and-so forward. He focused on Simeon and had him bound and led away in their presence. Simeon was the second born. The first born was Reuben, not Simeon. Reuben didn't do a good job as a big brother, so now Simeon, the second brother, is going to be the one in prison while they go. And Joseph wanted them to experience what he experienced. The horror of someone being led away. Joseph was led away and bound in. There they, they experienced themselves. Startled, took Simeon from their presence and was taken away. This may sound really cruel. And it certainly was painful and uncomfortable. But what God is doing here is helping, helping them. A big part of conflict resolution, a big part of re relational reconciliation is being able to see and to feel the other person's point of view. So, he's helping them see what it was like for Joseph. But also while this is happening, Joseph is feeling their pain as well, watching them anguish. It's helping them, even though it's painful. Then in verse 25, it says that Joseph gave orders to fill bags fill their bags with grain, they came for grain, and to put each man's silver back in his sack and to give them provisions for their journey home. After, you know, good things. Fill their bags with grain, all right, that's what they came for, that's what they needed. Put their silver back, they didn't have to pay for it. It says the silver was out to pay for the grain. He put the silver back in their bags or had that done by his servants and then gave them additional provisions, traveling food, to get back to their land. Very positive things. After this was done, they loaded their grain on their donkeys and they left. So all they need to do is to go back, bring Benjamin back, and things will be fine. At the place, in verse 27, where they stopped for the night, one of them opened his sack to get feed for his donkey, and he saw his silver in his bag. Notice, his reaction isn't, wow, that was really nice. That's cool, they gave, you know, we, 
That's not the reaction here. He opened his bag to get feed for his donkey. That's the only reason he's in the bag. And he saw that his silver was in the top of the bag. 28, he says, my silver has been returned, he said to his brother. Here it is in my sack. But the next thing is, wow, that's really great. How generous of the leader of Egypt. Their hearts sank. And they all trembled and said, what is this that God has done to us? See, what's going on here in the... Yeah, it is an emotional moment, I get it. Good timing. <laughs> They're struggling with guilt. They're struggling with the guilt of their sin. feeling very uncomfortable with these conversations about the youngest and bringing him back and the look, their, their discussion with each other about uh, under great distress. See, we're having to, uh, that, that thing we did 13 years ago that we swept under the carpet and we haven't, it's coming back to haunt us. And their hearts sink in, they're all, but they're not focusing on the generosity of Joseph. They're focused on, we're going to look like thieves. We intended to pay for the grain. We're going to look like thieves. We're going to be in trouble. And oh yeah, Simeon's in captivity. We could run and never come back, but Simeon will be lost. And so their hearts are quaking. They're trembling. And isn't this so like us as human beings? them and us. What is this that God is doing to us? It's God's fault. No, it's not God's fault. This is a culmination of their own sin and the guilt that they've been carrying for so many years. There's nothing. God is not inflicting punishment upon them. This is, but how quick we are. How quick we are to point fingers at God and somebody else when really... It's stuff is of our own doing, and we're dealing with the consequences of the past. Their hearts sank and they all trembled. This thing that was good and generous, and what is this that God has done to us? What's a takeaway for us? God's purposes, again, God's bigger purposes, often revisit the past or help us revisit our past in order to lead us forward. This is an unresolved issue in the personal history of their families, in their personal histories. This is a great wrong was done that was swept under the carpet and went along as nothing was wrong. And God's like, hey, I have bigger purposes in mind here, and this needs to be fixed in order to go forward. And so, yeah, it's uncomfortable. But God will often, just like God will often involve, His purposes involve relational reconciliation and conflict resolution. God's purposes often help us revisit, and the word is help. Help us revisit the past in order to lead us forward. Because otherwise, the past can get us stuck. Joseph's brothers were stuck. Joseph was somewhat stuck as well. This was going to help both going forward, both groups, and God's ultimate bigger purposes. And so, in our lives, it's important to remember, it's never just about me. It's never just about you. And that can be a comforting, powerful thing, that God is doing bigger and greater things, and that if I can come alongside and come into alignment with the way His light is shining, it's ultimately a good thing, a great thing for me and for those who are involved. Relational reconciliation, conflict resolution, and revisiting the past in order that it doesn't become a sticking point, but so that we can go forward. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that your, your scriptures are so full of life and are so spot on. Lord, thank you that, you know, we haven't gotten there yet, but 
You're really big into forgiveness. You're really big into reconciliation. You're really big into restoration and to going forward. And we're going to see that in the life of Joseph. And so, Lord, would you help us? Would you help us to trust your bigger purposes, to trust your bigger promises, and not just see our life as that of all that matters? Lord, would you help us to, again, keep short accounts with people and allow for reconciliation, be part of conflict resolution. Lord, would you help us, if there are sticking points from the past, would you help us find the resources that we need in you to go forward and not let them dog, it, dog us like they were dogging Joseph's brothers and in some ways like they were dogging Joseph himself, even though you were leading him forward. So Lord, as human beings, we're complicated. And in relating with others and living in this world that we live in, it's complicated. And there's, Lord, we need your help. We need your help, we need your grace, we need your power, and we need your forgiveness for ourselves and in our relationships with others. So Lord, we ask that you would help us in our specific situations, present, past, and future, to allow you to lead us forward, even when it's a bit uncomfortable, knowing that you have good plan for us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right. Moving beyond the shadow of the past, again, God's always forward-looking. Let's stand and we'll sing with the worship team as we close.